and that everyone knows what they're doing. And uh, he has a little bit less hair, and he's uh, a lot bit smiley. And uh, he's getting progressively less goofy, you know, like no more fanny pack. He doesn't wear glasses anymore. I don't know. You know this guy. Uh, anyway, Mike, dad, is in uh, Oklahoma City this morning. He is preaching at the North MacArthur Church of Christ. It was part of, uh, part of his uh, duty with affirming the faith. He was one of the speakers, and so he stayed up there, and he got to preach up there where uh, Tim, his brother, my uncle, preaches. And so that's where he's at this morning. So he texted me early in the week and said, you're the guy to confirm everyone. So I went around and made sure everyone knew what they were doing, you know. And, uh, and then I saw, either right after or right before me, that Daryl was also confirming everyone. <laughs> and then I noticed, at least once, that Donnie was also confirming everyone. And I said, are you doing it too? And he said, everyone is. And so we are sure we're going to have things going smooth this morning, all right? Uh, with that said, let's, uh, let's jump into the lesson. Y'all forgot who was preaching and went long on stuff. So... We, uh, we got a lesson on the Gospel of John, which means we could literally be here for two quarters and not finish what we got to finish. But we're going to get through it. Uh, this is actually a continuation on the series that we've done uh, over the past couple of weeks on themes in the Gospels. Uh, if you remember, we looked at uh, the, the idea of the Gospel being um, the good news about a new king and a new kingdom. And what that really means and how these books, these letters that were written by these different authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were actually just that. They were a proclamation. They were a declaration about a new king and a new kingdom and what that looked like and what that meant. And here's the hint is that it's really good news for you. Uh, Then we talked about Matthew and how he had this theme of the outcast. It seems like the outcast is always the one Jesus would gravitate towards. The outcast would understand things, whereas the in crowd would be confused. And that was sort of Matthew's gospel. Then we looked at Mark, and Mark wrote specifically to this Roman audience, and he portrayed Jesus in a way that the Romans would have really appreciated and been on board with. But he knew that the crucifixion would have lost his Roman audience, and so instead he would portray the crucifixion as a coronation, and we looked at the way the ceremony, the coronation ceremony of Roman emperors lined up with the way that uh, Mark portrayed Jesus' crucifixion. Awesome, awesome study. Uh, Then we looked at Luke, and we talked a bit about uh, feasting or, or sharing a table together in the Gospel of Luke, and how Jesus does this, like, over 10 times, he sits down and eats with people in the Gospel of Luke, and how each of those times is another, there's an important message brought or an important movement uh, that is made in, in the story. Then we looked at the Gospel of John, part one, and we talked about how the main theme in the Gospel of John is belief. John writes this story, and in the story, every time people interact with Jesus, they come away from it going, Wow, I believe. And then at the very end of the gospel, he says, and this is why I wrote it, so that you would believe, right? And so the gospel of John is a motivated writing that that is meant to instill belief in the reader. You see it happen with the people in the story. Then you see it happen with the story itself. And the implication is this is also supposed to happen when you show that to other people they are to believe as well. So uh, the other theme, though, I I really felt like there were two really prominent themes in the Gospel of John. If you remember our study on John, there are like a thousand themes in the Gospel of John, feasting, the word, the spirit, belief, uh, testimony or witness, all sorts of different themes run through this book. But these two, I felt like, were the the weightiest, the most important themes. And the one that we're talking about today is... um, uh, I, I called the lesson "Looking Through the Cross," the, through the, something like that. Looking through the cross. All right. Here's the idea. Here's the idea. When you read John's Gospel, and if you were in our study uh, when we studied this in class, some of this will be familiar, but hopefully it'll be a really good refresher. When you read John's Gospel, he has a way that he wants you to read it. Okay. Uh, if you if you watch a movie, you're you're sort of taken on a journey, and the director will set up the timeline of events in order to reveal certain parts at certain times so that the payoff at the end of the movie is satisfactory. Does that make sense? So the example I think I used last time was the movie The Sixth Sense, right? Uh, At the end of the movie, you find out that one piece of information that makes you go, 
oh, right? And, I mean, it's old enough that I, I don't think I can spoil it, right? Like, the guy is talking to this kid, and the kid says, I see dead people. And then by the end of the movie, you realize that's why the kid can see him, and he's been dead the whole time. And then you go back and you watch the movie again, and you're like, oh, that's why that, and this is why, and that's how. And it's like, wow, once I understood the ending, then I, I really saw that movie in a different light. Uh, other movies are like this. I think the movie Interstellar has sort of this same idea where once you understand how things happened in the end, you zoom back out and you go, whoa, this whole story is really, really cool. That's a really cool story. Now, John's gospel is better than a really cool story. It is a powerful message about a new king and a new kingdom. And so what is John doing that is like those other gospels? Well, he wants, or is like those other movies. He wants you to read his gospel in light of the cross. John is building his gospel. It's a slow, like, indie film pacing kind of narrative where, where Jesus does things and then has these long conversations, these big dialogue scenes with people like Nicodemus or the woman at the well uh, or the, the, uh, the interaction that he, John writes about with the, the formerly blind man having to recount his story three times to the leaders of the Jews, right? It's this slow pace. And then at the very end, you have an even slower pace, like chapter... 13, 14, 15-ish through the end of the book basically only talk about one week of Jesus' life and the crucifixion. And that's all that last half of the book deals with. And so what John wants you to do is he wants you to read through the book and then when you get to the crucifixion, that's supposed to be the O oh moment, right? So you get to the crucifixion and you read it and you read about what Jesus did and you're supposed to go, Oh, and look back at the rest of the book, read it all over again, but this time, you know the ending, okay? So let me show you a couple of reasons why I think this is exactly what John is doing. The first one, uh, in John chapter 2, that JP read for us this morning. Uh, you notice this was something that was in the last theme lesson about belief, and when we studied John, this is all over the place. John has, his, has the people in the book doing what he wants you to be doing, all right? And so exactly that is what's happening here. Jesus cleanses the temple in John chapter 2, 13 through uh, uh, 17. He turns over the, the money changers' tables and drives people out of the temple, and then in verse 18... The Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Basically, if you're going to do these things, you better have a reason or a miracle to prove that you're not just acting a fool in here, right? And then Jesus' sign is, verse 19, destroy this temple and I, in three days. I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. See, they haven't read the end of the book yet, right? They're confused because what bizarre statement. If I came in here and I just destroyed all the chairs and I said, hey... You guys want to see something cool? In 10 minutes, I'll have all the chairs set right back up. And Tommy would say, it took me three and a half hours to set up all these chairs. No, I mean, you get the idea. Like, there's a different conversation going on. They're missing each other. And so Jesus says, I'll raise this temple up. And then John pokes his head in as the narrator in verse 21. And he says, but he, Jesus, was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, after what? After the cross... His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So his disciples have this experience where it seems like they were just as confused as the Pharisees in this instance, where Jesus turns over the tables, and they're like, oh yeah, zeal for his house, we'll consume him. And then he says this weird thing about raising up the temple in three days, and it took them a while, but after the cross, they remembered that he said this, and they were like, oh Wow. And it says the result was that they believed in the word, uh, the scripture and the word that he had spoken. This happens uh, a similar, not exactly the same, but in chapter 7 and verse 39, uh, Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast and he shouts in front of everybody, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, in verse 38. So that's that's John 7, 37 and 38. Jesus cries out this, this strange thing. He basically just says, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. And then he quotes an Old Testament passage that essentially is Jesus standing as the symbol of something important to the Jews, this living water. And in verse 39, John pokes his head out as the narrator and says, now this he said about the spirit 
whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified, right? So John is saying, when you read the end of this story, and you, you hear about the Spirit coming after Jesus is, is crucified and raised from the dead, right? After that, the Spirit will come. That's what he was talking about here. Once you read the end of the story, you understand more of what Jesus was saying in the rest of the story. Uh, John chapter 12, another really good example of this. Uh, this kind of ties into the, the last time uh, I, I preached on a Sunday morning and we talked about donkeys, which if you just tell someone that out of context, I've gotten so many funny responses. Uh, but John chapter 12, right after uh, he comes in on uh, riding on a donkey in verse 16. So he, come, he rides in on a donkey. They, they remember what was written. And then in verse 16, John, again, pokes his head out as the narrator and says, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him all right so you've got another exact same thing john is saying this happened to these people and it should happen to you as well when you understand the cross it should shape it should reframe it should be a new pair of glasses that you look at this gospel with so you get to the end of the story and you go wow amazing let me read it again and see if I understand some more. Let me read it a third time and see if I see something new. That's what John wants you to do with his gospel. Now, I think that's awesome. And, uh, and I've had a lot of fun looking through this and, and seeing spots where we could do this. We're going to look at, I, I have as many as three that we could look at, but I think we might only have time for one. We might do two. We'll see how long it takes. I don't know. The guy up here gets pretty long-winded. So look at John chapter 2. Look at John chapter 2. So, so that's how John wants you to read his gospel, right? He wants you to read everything in his gospel through the cross, right? So pretend you have glasses that are shaped like the cross, right? You put on your cross glasses, and then you read through John's gospel. So that's what we're going to do. John chapter 2 uh, and the wedding at Cana. So uh, verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus uh, also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew where it came from, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first signs, uh, first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. All right. Now there's a couple of things. First, uh, this, is a, this is an incredible story. And it is so loaded, so loaded with importance in the littlest, tiniest of details. The first thing when we talk about this story, is you have to know what wine is meant to represent from the Old Testament, okay? A couple of places we can look. Genesis chapter 49 and, uh, and verse 10 and 11. This is a, a prophecy about Judah. It says that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. Uh, the nations will obey him, binding his foal to the vine and his colt to the choicest vine, he will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. All right, there are two important details here that are brought up about the symbol that wine is. Okay, the first thing is wine is a symbol of luxury and plenty, right? So in this passage talking about Judah, he's going to bind his, his donkey to the choicest vine, right? The idea here is because Judah is in, uh, is in power... He's going to have the best wine. Sound familiar, right? He's going to have the best, the choicest wine, okay? Then the other part of this is that he's going to wash his garments in wine, uh, his robes in the blood of grapes. There's a parallel between wine and blood, 
Uh, is anybody familiar with a parallel between wine and blood? Maybe a thing we just did a couple minutes ago. It's not an uncommon thing when you think about the symbol of wine. The fruit, the, the juice from a grape is often used as a symbol for blood. We do it every week, okay? And that's something that John is definitely doing here. Joel chapter 3 is another spot that really highlights this. Joel chapter 3 and verse 17 He says, you will be uh, convinced that I, the Lord, am your God, dwelling on Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy. Conquering armies will no longer pass through it. On that day, the mountains will drip sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the dry stream beds of Judah will flow with water. A spring will flow out from the temple of the Lord, watering the valleys of the valley of acacia trees. Egypt will be desolate and Edom will be a desolate wilderness because of the violence they did to the people of Judah in whose land they shed innocent blood. But Judah will reside securely forever and Jerusalem will be secure from one generation to the next. I will avenge their blood, which I had not previously acquitted. It is the Lord who dwells in Zion. Okay, so there's this parallel here, right? Judah used to drip with blood because of the violence of, in this passage, Edom and Egypt. Because of what Edom and Egypt did, their violence caused Judah to be covered in blood, which is a symbolic way of saying a lot of death. There was blood everywhere, bloodshed, you might think. All right? But the prophecy about what Judah is going to look like is meant to be the parallel inverse of that. He says that the mountains will drip, not with blood like they used to, but with wine. Right? So it's two things. It's blood and wine clearly have a connection. And it's also that wine is a symbol of the kingdom of God. There is an important part of the kingdom of God that is symbolized through wine and blood. Okay? So here's what we need to get from that. Wine equals blood. Okay? Wine equals blood. Second thing we need to get is that the idea of a feast is a symbol for eternity. When we think about heaven... The prophets and, uh, and, and the Jews of the day thought of heaven as a giant feast. Why in the world would they think that? Because that's how the prophets wrote about it. Those were the pictures that the prophets used to communicate what heaven would be like. So Isaiah chapter 28, uh, we're not going to go over and read all of this one, but it, it's a picture of a feast. On that day, there will be the choicest of meats and the best of wine, the marrow. And then it says, God will also be eating. He will swallow up death forever, right? So a picture of eternity is this big feast with the best wine and the best meat, and then God is there, swallowing up death. There's no more death. We're all just feasting all the time, which is really cool. Okay, so with those ideas in the back of our mind, right, with those ideas ready, look at this story again. You've got a situation where there is a wedding feast, which means people have come from all over the place. Culturally, this would have been an enormous social event. The burden would have been on the host to not only feed, but to keep the guests entertained and fed for several days. All right? Several days. If you have a wedding at like 6 o'clock in the evening, there's there's a little bit of an expectation that you should have a meal, right? Like, generally. It's not like you must have a meal, and if you don't, it's, it brings reproach on your whole family. But it's like, I mean, if you're going to plan a wedding right in the middle of dinner time, have dinner, right? That's the best comparison I can think of, except if you don't serve dinner, you bring reproach on your whole family. That's the mindset of these people, okay? So when the wine runs out at the wedding, it's enormous embarrassment for the family. A wedding feast typically would last seven days, and this one only made it three It's embarrassing, it's shameful, and it's, uh, you know, among other things, just a bit of a bummer, right? We were supposed to party for four more days celebrating this wedding, and we got it cut short. Okay, so, man, there's so much more in here, even that I'm thinking about as we're going through this again. Notice, it says, on the third day, there was a wedding, there was a feast, okay? Then the feast is in jeopardy of ending early, And so Jesus goes, and look at what he uses. 
in verse 6, there were six stone, wa uh, stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So there were these jars, and the jars were used by the priests or used by people to cleanse themselves according to the old law. These were special jars, not hey, I've got a couple Dickies cups in the cabinet. This was, like, this was like grandma's antique crystal, right? Like this was important stuff that was used for religious things only, right? And so Jesus goes and he grabs those, purification jars. Okay, so now let's retell this story. He fills up the jars with water, the water turns into wine, and the feast is, is saved, right? It's rescued. Okay. So what if we tell the story with the images that are associated with these things, with the symbols that are associated? You've got Jesus rescuing the wedding from ending early with blood in jars meant for purification. Some might call it purifying blood. Because of that, on the third day, the wedding is saved. And all the people get to remain in the feast, which is eternity. Okay, if you don't know the cross, you don't know that Jesus' blood is meant to purify us from our sins. If you don't know about hope of eternal life, you don't know that that blood is what, is what saves us and allows us to be in eternity. If you know about the cross, then you go back and you read John chapter 2, you see that this sign that was being done was more than just, wow, what a cool trick. This sign that was being done was the literal gospel being preached in a picture. Jesus, on the third day, rose from the dead, and he saved the world through his purifying blood so that we could all feast in eternity with God. Jesus, on the third day, rose up, turned water into wine, and then rescued the feast with the blood of grapes in purification jars so that everyone could continue the feast. Do you see it? Do you see, did you put your cross glasses on and do you see what's going on? John wants you to read his whole gospel this same way. We have two more. We have no more. We're going to do one more. Look at John 11. Can't do no more. Look at John 11. I think this, we can do this one fairly quickly. John chapter 11, you have the story of the death of Lazarus. All right, John 11, let's start in verse 1. Uh, now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, there's a couple of things that are problems there. First of all, um, this illness very much led to death. Like Lazarus definitely dies. That, that's why they sent this letter was because Lazarus' death was eminent. And then he did die. So Jesus is either wrong here or something else is going on. Which if you remember when he said he was going to raise up the temple in three days, clearly there's probably something else going on that we might understand better in light of the cross. You see how this is working, okay? Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he rushed over there to be with his friends. Like, that's what we would do, right? But it doesn't say that. It says that he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He waited. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? All right, now, a couple of things. When you read through John, this shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, John chapter 5, the, uh, in verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. John chapter 7, in verse 1, after this, Jesus went about Galilee. He would not go about Judea because the Jews were there seeking to kill him. John 7, in verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to Arrest him. John 8 and verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him. And Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. John 10 and verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. John 10 and verse 39. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. One, two, three, four, five, six other times. It has been said very clearly. If you go to Judea, you will either be arrested or killed or both. And he knew that. And so he wasn't going in Judea. Right? And so he tells his disciples, hey, 
let's go back to Judea. And their response is, we've been avoiding that place for a reason, right? Like, they want to kill you. Like, not kind of. They literally picked up stones last time. Do you remember this, Jesus? Yeah, let's go. Let's head that way. Uh, So let's skip down to uh, Lazarus dies. Let's look at verse 14. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, if you look up commentaries, I I am surprised at how many of these see it as Thomas going to die with Lazarus. I read one commentary that actually said, this is meant to paint Thomas in a doubting, negative light. He's sarcastically saying, well, let's go die with Lazarus. If we go there, we'll die too, so whatever, let's go do it. And I'm going to be honest, I've, I used to be really confused by this, but now, understanding John as a whole picture, instead of just one weird little verse in verse 16, it makes a little more sense. Because if you're a disciple of Jesus, that means you're going to follow him. If they're going to kill Jesus, they're likely going to kill his followers. And so what Thomas says here is not riddled with doubt, but riddled with devotion. I think I said this in the last class, that he's more like a devoted Thomas than a doubting Thomas here. He says, if we're going into Jerusalem or Judea and, and our, our leader is going to be killed, I guess let's go with him. I mean, if he's going, we're going. Let's go die. If he dies, we die. That's doubting Thomas. Man, aren't people more than one moment of their life? Listen, so Thomas makes this really weird but really impactful statement once you read it in the context. Then Jesus speaks with Martha, and uh, they have a little back and forth about the resurrection. She said, hey, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. He says, your brother will rise again. Martha's like, well, I know about the resurrection. And Jesus like, I am the resurrection. And then Martha's like, okay, I believe You're the Christ, which is a really cool exchange. Makes me want to be more like Martha. Jesus then comes to the tomb. It says he stinketh in the old King James because Lazarus had been dead about four days. And I guess that's about the time that the smell starts to happen. And uh, Jesus sees all the people weeping and he weeps as well. Then in verse 38, Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have, uh, that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Okay, a couple of things. Well, yeah, a couple of things here. If we're supposed to read this in light of the cross and we're supposed to read the end of the book, understand it, come back. One thing you really need to do here is compare and contrast Lazarus' resurrection with Jesus' resurrection. This is one of the things I know we did in the class because I thought it was cool and I was teaching the class. So that's how I know we did it. Uh, When you compare and contrast, one of the details that you notice is that Lazarus is bound with linen, right? And he needs someone else to unbind him. It's like he's still wrapped in the burial cloth. You could say, as a picture, as a symbol, he's wrapped in death. He still has the wrappings of death on him as he walks out of the tomb, and someone else has to get that off of him. When Jesus is raised, where are his linens? Well, they they find the tomb empty, first of all. No one has to come get him. He didn't stink, second of all. Third of all, when they find the empty tomb, his linens are folded. Nobody had to take them off of him, right? Death has no hold on him. You see this? When you read the end, you understand the middle. It's so cool. All right. Here's the last part of this. All right, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Who was wanting to kill Jesus again? The Pharisees. These are tattletales. They're the worst. All right, verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. 
But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. You see what's happening here? If you know the end, that sentence is awesome, right? Because Jesus did die one man on behalf of the many. One man did die so that many could live. Even cooler, though, he, was just, he just did that in chapter 11, right? Jesus, in chapter 11, right, goes into Judea where death is eminent, so eminent that his disciples say, listen, he dies, we die, let's follow him into death, right? And so his disciples follow him in knowing he's going to die. He heads into Judea knowing he's going to die. But why did he go to Judea? So that his friend could live. See, what Jesus did in the story of Lazarus is he made an exchange. He traded Lazarus. He, he, he went into death so that someone else could be raised from the dead. And then ultimately, like Caiaphas says unknowingly, he went into death so that all of us could be raised from the dead. This is what John wants you to do with his gospel. Let's do one more. Just kidding. All right. Uh, John chapter uh, 13 with the, the washing of the disciples' feet is the other place. I'll tell you about it later, or you can go figure it out on your own after you read the end. It's a lot of fun to do. Uh, here's the deal. When, when you read John's gospel, one of the main themes is to read it in light of the cross. The cross should shape the way that you read everything in John's gospel because everything will make better sense once you understand what's being done on the cross. Okay, so how do we do that in our life? Well, I think the first thing is that this is not just about John's gospel. This is about any time we approach the scripture, reading it through the lens of the cross. If we come to scripture and we just pretend we don't have the cross, we are going to be missing things. But if we come to scripture and we put our cross-shaped glasses on and we read, we start noticing something awesome. Uh, a friend of mine calls this a cruciform hermeneutic, which is a really fancy way of saying exactly what we just said, right? You, you read the Bible and understand what it wants for you to do based on the cross, okay? Wally LaHaye sent me a text today, and I won't read you all of these because it's a lot of them, but he sent me a text uh, on Thursday, and it just, no context, I love the text for the record, Wally, uh, no context, he just shot me this text. He said, in Genesis, Jesus Christ is the breath of life. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day. He's the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. He, he went through every book of the Bible, just so you know. There are 39, and then he sent me another text a day later with 27 more for the New Testament. You know what Wally's doing? He's reading the scripture with his cross glasses on. He's looking for Jesus because he's been there in the whole story. And so if we're going to learn from what John does in his gospel, we need to learn to read the entire Bible through the lens of the cross. Secondly, this should impact how you treat people, which is just not as impactful a statement as I want it to be, because I feel like we hear that and we go, yeah, I got to treat people good. No, you have to treat people in light of the cross. The, the, the cross should be your question as to why I'm doing uh, to this person what I'm doing. When, uh, when Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He's doing exactly that. He says, when you're in a marriage, and just before that he tells wives, submit to your husbands, right, as to the Lord. You realize both of those are living in light of the cross. Did Jesus not submit in going to the cross, submit to the fathers? Absolutely he did. Uh, did Jesus not give up his life on behalf of the ch absolutely he did that's living in light of the cross colossians 3 and verse 23 says whatever you do work heartily as for the lord and not for men you're not working for you you're saying hey jesus worked really hard on the cross the cross was a hard thing to do and this is not as hard as that 
So I'm going to do this for God the way Jesus did the cross for God. You think about loving your neighbor uh, or loving your enemy. Uh, you don't. Jesus loved me to the point of the cross. Surely I can love in this situation. Radical hospitality. Jesus emptied himself, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Surely we can empty our, our cupboards or our wallets. Jesus always was esteeming others as more important than himself. Surely, if we look at the cross, we should be able to see that others were more important to Christ than himself. And believing the best about people. Would it not have been within Jesus' knowledge and within his reasonability to say, most of the people I do this for will not even care. Not worth it. Honestly, they're all really selfish people, and they do terrible things all the time, and I don't think it's worth going to the cross. That's a really big price to pay for someone who doesn't care about it. Would that not have been within his, within his right? Sure, certainly it would have. Jesus chose to believe the best about us, that if I give them this opportunity, if I tell them and show them the way, if I make the way through death by my sacrifice on the cross, That will give people eternal life. It gives them the chance. He could have been really cynical about whether or not we would choose to believe. But you know how I know he wasn't? Because he went to the cross. If we're going to live in light of the cross, we have to, in light of the cross, we have to believe the best about people. Lastly, this should impact every day how you make your choices. This is not a question of. Uh, what would Jesus do? Although that's a great question. This is what would the cross do, which is grammatically incorrect, all right? This is, am I making a choice that is going to reflect the the values and the traits that I saw on the cross? Am I living in a way that demonstrates what happened on the cross? Am I living like I believe the cross happened? Your whole life, every choice that you make should be filtered through the lens of the cross. There was a, a trend on the internet not that long ago. Maybe it's still a thing. I don't know. I'm not on TikTok, fortunately. And, but there were these women who would go up to their husbands and they would ask them a question. Have you all seen this? They'd say, hey, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Have you heard that? Like out of absolutely nowhere, they'd go ask their husbands that question. And it was just bizarre the number of responses where the husbands were like, probably two or three times a week. I was like, why are you thinking about the Roman Empire that often, right? Um, but there were like, like thousands of responses like this where like, yeah, I think about it all the time. I, I thought about it this morning, that kind of stuff. It was just bizarre, right? Okay. How often do you think about the cross? Is it two or three times a week? Is it every morning? Is it every evening? Do you think about the cross before every decision? Because if you read John's gospel and you pick up on this theme of looking at your life through the lens of the cross, that's what he's calling you to do. Every choice, every moment, every breath lived in light of the cross. The cross is why we do what we do, to put it another way. So here's the question this morning. Have you been buried with Christ? Is your life living in light of the cross? Are you living a new life in light of the cross, having your old one already nailed to it? Do you make every choice because of what happened on the cross? If someone was asked about your choices, would they be able to say, at the very least, he makes those choices because he's a Christian? Or would they be saying, yeah, I don't know. His choices are pretty haphazard. Do you live in light of the cross? And ultimately, have you put on Christ in baptism to live like a crucified person, like our Messiah, to be a Christian, to have your sins washed away by purifying blood, to have your, your, your soul added to God's lists in eternity, to be with God in a right relationship with him forever? If you haven't this morning, We can show you more about what the Bible says. And if you need prayers this morning of anything, we're people that live in light of the cross here. At least we try to. So if you come up, there's no judgment at the foot of the cross. There's mercy. If you come up, if you've got something you need, there are prayers at the foot of the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you have any need, there are people who love you, and we can help you with whatever it is. If you'll come forward and let us know while we stand and sing.